Noreen Hertz is a renowned thought leader, academic, and broadcaster. She is the author of The Silent Takeover from 2002, The Debt Threat from 2005, and Eyes Wide Open from 2013, each of which has been published in more than 20 countries. Her opinion pieces have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, among many others. She has also made frequent television appearances around the world, including on shows such as CBS This, this Morning, uh, BBC's Question Time, NHK's Global Debate, and has created and hosted four television documentaries, including 2007's The Million Pound Footballers Giveaway, in which she documents her search for footballers willing to donate their wages to fund a nurse's hardship fund. She's currently based at the University of College London, where she holds an honorary professorship at the Institute for Global Prosperity. Steve Scher is a podcaster, broadcaster, writer, interviewer, and teacher. He's the former host of KUOW FM's Weekday and has taught interviewing at the University of Washington since 2009. His in-depth interviews with award-winning authors, political leaders, Scientists, artists, and active citizens are noted for their intelligence and sensitivity. He moved into podcasting, excited to be a part of the social movement that is democratizing access, and is currently chief correspondent of Town Hall's Insider Podcast in the moment. Steve is also the host of the podcast series at length with Steve Share. Hertz's book, The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World That's Pulling Apart, is the subject of today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Noreena Hertz and Steve Scher. Thanks, Candice. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, um, Noreena, I just I want to ask you something right off the bat, that, and I'll come back to it again. But um, did you notice at the beginning Candice's statement about uh, acknowledging the the, that we sit on native land and acknowledging the Duwamish. You know, when you, throughout your book, you're, you're talking about community and how connections create the community we need to create. And I, I, I always find that sentence, which I don't know if that's prevalent around the world, but it's very prevalent here in places like Town Hall, the university and other places to sort of start at a fundamental level that acknowledges our history. Seems to me like a, a really good way to start to break down our loneliness, to acknowledge, for example, the Duwamish who are yet to be a recognized tribe by the federal government. And yet we remember to acknowledge them. And I don't know, I guess I'm asking you for your reaction to that because I don't know that if you've heard that sort of sentence very often. I was I was actually struck um, when Candice made that comment and 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 and, and acknowledged um, this group and and I was really struck by it because you are absolutely right. History: whose community are we talking about? Um, when we use the word community, what do we actually mean? Whose community? Who has it, who is entitled to be part of this community? Who are we intentionally including and intentionally excluding um, when we use that term? We sometimes romanticize the term community. And although, you know, as I'm sure our conversation will um, uncover, I, I am very pro-community. I also, I also recognize that sometimes we, we can romanticize the term without really interrogating what it means and who it's excluding. So I think, so I think, yes. Yeah, I always find it interesting. Well, we'll come back to community and, and, and these issues, but so let me start with a different uh, kind of community and something that you write about in the book a little later on, but I was, I struck by it because it seems also fundamental. Um, sometimes when I'm alone wandering around, and I ask Alexa a question uh, and she doesn't answer me the way I like, I yell at her. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I yell at her. And I and I and and you you write about that phenomenon in the book. And you say, you ask the question, are we teaching our children and ourselves really to be unkind to one another? Because maybe being unkind to the AI translates into being unkind to our neighbor. Yes. You think so we are? um 
So, it, so actually, one of the reasons I started thinking about how lonely and isolated we'd become and what the implications were, one of the reasons was because I had bought an Alexa myself and, and had realized that I was growing increasingly attached to my Alexa. Um, now, unlike you, I think I'm very consciously kind to my Alexa, like do say, do say please and thank you even to my Alexa. But as I, um, but it, it was, it was the fact that I was able to have a kind of quasi relationship with this inanimate object that I found really fascinating and got me to start thinking about the role that the market and innovation can play in alleviating our loneliness. But back to your kind of observation about people being mean to their Alexas. Um, and Alexa's encouraging perhaps unkindness. I mean, there have been, uh, there's been a host of kind of anecdotal data out there now of children in particular, um, you know, growing up now, an incredible percentage of households now have virtual assistance of some form in their homes and children growing up, you know, getting very used to barking orders at their devices without saying please or thank you, um, which starts to raise questions, of course, um, if we start to feel connected to these inanimate objects, whether it's Alexa devices or something I look at at length in my book, social robots, um, you know, robots designed specifically to play the role of companion, friend, carer. Um, if we are able to be rude and mean and cruel and angry to these machines or devices with impunity, the danger is that this would bleed into our relationships with each other, that we practice unkindness, that the Alexa skill we learn is unkindness. Um, but actually, and I write this in the book, kind of recently, even um, Amazon, I think, had so many parents actually writing in saying that they were concerned about how their kids were interacting, that they actually have created a setting that you can that you can turn on so that your kids, when they speak to your Alexa, have to be more polite. But it's quite it's not easy to find that setting on the device. Why not just build it in with that device already? Yeah, why not? Do you think that that unkindness teaching uh, exists also in social media and social gaming. Is it mm. the same thing? So I began my research. I was really interested in the role that social media played in today's loneliness crisis. And maybe just to kind of set it up, you know, we really are talking about even before the pandemic, a loneliness crisis with one in five Americans often or always lonely. One in five millennials saying they don't have a single friend. I find that stat quite incredible. And I, I was interested, of course, in the role that social media did, played or didn't play in today's loneliness crisis. And, um, and so I looked at all the uh, research that was out there and I also interviewed a lot of teenagers. And one of the things that came out of my research with teenagers was how cruel the um, platforms were to them. Because, you know, I think, you know, we, we do, we are aware, of course, well, by now that these platforms are vectors of toxicity and hate and hate speech and anger and polarized debate. We're kind of aware of that, but sometimes we don't think about how perhaps it's affecting you know, young people at a less extreme level, in, but still a very significant level. In the United Kingdom, 65% of students have experienced cyberbullying firsthand, for example. And in my interviews with teenagers, you know, even if um, I think there were a few different ways in which one might think of the platforms as ultimately delivering an unkind outcome. One was just how um, excluded so many of the teenagers felt because, because so much of their social life and status is now recognized and um, 
manufactured online, um, many felt that that they were being excluded on these media, which actually had huge resonance and importance to them. So one 14 year old boy, for example, Peter told me about how he would post on Instagram and then be waiting, 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 hoping for somebody to like one of his posts. And when they didn't saying to me, he said to me, I felt so invisible. I was just asking myself, what was I doing wrong? Why did no one like me? Or Claudia, a girl who told me about after, um, her school's homecoming. Her friends told her that they weren't going out afterwards, but they actually did go out because she was scrolling on her social media and she saw them all hanging out without her. And she said she felt so terrible, so excluded um, that she hid in her bedroom for a week and wouldn't leave it. So the media, these social media can be very excluding and it can also be actually unkind, bullying, toxic, um, not only for teenagers, but this is a group who I think we sometimes don't think of as being exposed to that to the extent that they are. And, and both of those, a toxic world, a cruel world, and a world in which you feel excluded is of course also going to be a lonely one. And that's, and that's something else, um, maybe for those who are listening in to also kind of get lay out right up top is that when we think about loneliness we typically think about loneliness as being something that primarily affects the elderly and it is true that the elderly are affected by loneliness for sure but it's actually the young who are the loneliest and and that's something that I think I found surprising. Why is that? Social media is inevitably a really big part of this because um, we've seen increased rates of loneliness amongst young people, teenagers, from about 2010 onwards, which really aligns, is in lockstep with uh, social media usage amongst this generation and smartphone usage more generally. Um, it's, so it's partly because just the quality of interaction on smartphones or uh, through social media is inferior to face-to-face -face interaction. It's partly because of the excluding toxic nature of social media. It's partly because the, these devices are so addictive, social media designed as we all know by now, to be so addictive that, um, that it takes us away from our in-person relationships. Um, so all of those kind of part of the reasons and really the, up until about a year and a half ago, though, it was hard to know definitively whether this was just um, coincidental, that we were just seeing this rise in social media usage um, and this rise in loneliness at the same time. You know, we could see a correlation, but we couldn't establish causality. And then about a year and a half ago, there was a very seminal study done at Stanford University where uh, they got 1,500 students to keep on using their Facebook as usual, and they got another 1500 to stop using Facebook for two months. And then they checked what was going on with the students. And what they found was unambiguous. The group who stopped using Facebook not only um, spent less time on Facebook, they just no time on Facebook, they just spent less time on the internet in general and more time doing things in person with friends and family. And they also, the research has found, was significantly happier and significantly less lonely. And then there've been a number of studies since then that have um, kind of done similar types of studies where people are actually charged with stopping using social media. And you can see a marked improvement in how lonely or otherwise they feel. I wanna come back to the, the impact of COVID on this and the future, which you write about in your book, as you, as you write about in the book that you updated it, brought it about, but let me, let me go back to, um, I mean, you're making a very complex argument about loneliness. And mm. I'll, I'll let you define it too, but you know, you're talking about the economics of loneliness, the architecture of loneliness, um, how workplace environments shape and, and then reshape us and then also technology. But you also write that loneliness is one of the greatest public health challenges of our time. Uh, uh, Theresa May said that when she established uh, what the what a minister for loneliness. Mm. So what's the what are the public what are the health issues 
around loneliness that affect young and old? So there are clearly mental health um, ramifications, uh, which, which are perhaps more obviously known. So a, um, a link between people who feel lonely and higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression, and at the extreme higher rates of suicide. And, you know, I don't think it's coincidental by any means that months and months of lockdowns and protracted and forced periods of isolation that we've seen in recent months are also um, yielding higher levels of mental health problems across the world and even um, higher levels of suicide amongst the young as well. Um, but it's not just our mental health that loneliness impacts. Loneliness also affects our physical health to a really considerable degree. Uh, researchers have established that loneliness is as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, and why this is, is because we're essentially designed not to be lonely. And so we were never meant to be lonely. Uh, and so our bodies have evolved with a kind of um, lever built in so that if we're feeling lonely, um, an alarm bell rings. Our body goes into fight or flight mode, essentially. Our heart rate goes up, our stress levels go up, our blood pressure goes up. All of these signaling to our body um, and signaling to us, don't be on your own, go and find your tribe, go and find the people to hunt and gather with. Um, trouble is in contemporary life, we don't do that. So we just, rem so we remain all too often on our own or not on our own because being on your own isn't necessarily um, being lonely. It's important to say that, but we remain in a state of loneliness um, for a protracted period, for days, weeks, months, um, even longer. And being in that state of fight or flight, high alert for a protracted period is really bad for our physical health. I mean, loneliness has been found to increase our rate of heart disease by 29%, increase our rate of stroke by 32%, decrease um, our life expectancy. So by 30%, um, we're 30% more likely to die prematurely if we're lonely than if we're not. And yet it's this huge public health issue and yet we rarely, rarely talk about it in that sphere. And of course also imposing a huge economic cost on the state, partly because of the healthcare, associated healthcare costs, but also as you alluded to, um, because loneliness is bad for business as well. Lonely workers are less productive, less efficient, less motivated, more likely to leave a job. So loneliness isn't only really bad for our health, it's also really bad for our health, for our wealth and for our economy. And it's also affects who we vote for. And that's something else that I explore in my book, um, the link between loneliness and the rise in right-wing populism that we've seen across the globe in recent years. You, um, I'll jump to that since you gave me the opening there. You talk about Hannah Arendt and mm -hmm. the totalitarian mind, which she's quite well known for. And you and she make the link. So between, between um, how people become attracted to a totalitarian way of thinking or, mm -hmm. uh, but, make that link for me. Why is, why is, um, why has America, which had a populist leader for four years, right? He, he was a populist in the quotes there, uh, and brought many people together, right? He had big rallies. He had people identify, uh, with the group think mm -hmm. to the point where they led an insurrection. Um, why is that at, in your argument grounded in a sense of isolation and loneliness. Hmm. So I said one of the reasons for starting this research was having bought an Alexa, but another reason was that I'd been, I'd been researching the rise of right-wing populism across the globe in France, in Germany, in Italy, and of course in the United States under Trump. 
And as I interviewed and heard testimonies from voters for right-wing populists, one thing that came out time and time again from their stories was how lonely they felt. Lonely in two senses, lonely in the sense of lacking friends, um, social support network, uh, um, feeling that they were missing the brotherhood of the workplace was one, what one railroad worker in East Tennessee who'd, who came from a family with a tradition of voting Democrat but had turned to Trump in 2016 told me. Um, so missing, so lonely in that sense. And there's actually a body of empirical data to show that people who are socially isolated are more likely to vote for right-wing populists and that Trump voters in 2016 were much more likely than say Hillary Clinton voters to say that they had no friends or acquaintances and only had themselves to rely upon. So lonely in that sense, but also lonely in the sense of feeling invisible, unheard, unseen, marginalized, left behind. So when I talk about loneliness, I talk about loneliness as, yes, being dis feeling disconnected from your friends and family, but also feeling disconnected from your political leaders, from your employer, from the state, about feeling uncared for, by those closest to you, but also by these bigger institutions. And time and time again, when I heard from, and when I interviewed right-wing populist voters across the globe, there was this sense of being forsaken, marginalized, left behind, that they also um, spoke of. And right-wing populists have played incredibly well to both of those. Um, both of those aspects of loneliness. So, you know, delivering the theatre of community with the rallies and the chants and the branded gear, um, for sure. And so delivering community in that sense. And, you know, Eric, a Parisian baker who's turned to the right wing populist Le Pen, told me about the community he felt delivering leaflets on Wednesday nights with his fellow um, Rassemblement National members. So delivering community in that sense, um, but also of course, speaking to the sense of forsakenness that many of these people feel. You know, Trump, you know, we'll talk about the forgotten people. I am the only one who's hearing you. And of course the community that they're proffering is a very exclusive and excluding community. Of course they're weaponizing community for um, often very malevolent purposes but um, but it's but it's a, but these are but their messages land um, and I you know and continue to land with considerable numbers of people who feel um, excluded and marginalized and you know and maybe and in particular arguably people who feel newly so who historically perhaps didn't feel so. So um, I see, I, 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 I get can, I, I'm trying to wrap that around, for example, and you just said it, the, the, the people who feel new, newly, newly so, or in America, the people, white people who feel that people who are not looking like them are gonna take their jobs, you know, as uh, <laughs> South Park did a series, an episode on that one time. Um, and yet, meanwhile, a 2020 survey, you write, of over 10,000 Americans established that Black and Hispanic people mm -hmm. feel lonelier than their white peers, significantly more alienated in their workplaces. Mm -hmm. Gender discrimination plays a role as well, right? LGBTQ discrimination plays a role, sexism. So why, why don't they respond to those same populist messages? Or why, why don't they throw up leaders, perhaps, that offer mm. those same kind, similar mm. populist messages? Well, I think, well, I mean, they're not turning to those populists because right. those right. because those populists are at the same time saying, actually, we don't want people like you and people right. who look at you and we're going to build our walls to make sure people like you aren't even allowed in. So, so we can uh, look at Africa, we can look at Brazil and see similar messages speaking to people of color. Yes. Um, so I think, um, 
Yes, yeah, so I think um, I think there is a real question, kind of why has the left, um, more generally, not um, not been able to speak to whether it's the white disenfranchised group, um, or um, or um, or other groups as well, but. Um, That's not as critical, uh, though. What was that? That's not as critical, though. The, why the left hasn't been able to reach those groups? Is that as uh, critical a question? Oh, that is as absolutely. I mean, that is absolutely as critical a question, and that's something that the left kind of needs to be asking itself now. Um, you know, and it seems to be kind of something that the Biden administration, you know, is you know, asking is kind of looking at whether it's call for unity and kind of, and it's um, a spaz commitment to um, speak to those groups as well. But yeah, I mean, and, and I, you know, I argue that what happened is that really we had a process of about 40 years now since kind of Reagan, um, came into power and, and um, Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom when a very particular form of capitalism took hold, which, um, which has played, I argue, a really significant role in the breakdown of community and, um, and, and a feeling of marginalization and alienation by many people. Um, you know, in economic terms, as wages of low income and working class workers have flatlined um, or even fallen in real terms um, over that period. Um, but also in promulgating a kind of mindset, uh, a mindset of dog eat dog, selfish, me first, self interested mindset which increasingly became valorized and became taken to be the norm. Um, and that mindset was always going to create a, a society that was about taking, not giving, hustling, not helping, um, a fractured society that, was, that didn't um, acknowledge the importance of the collective and the community. You, um, you have an interesting way of talking about that and writing about it. In, in the book, in this is a quote from you. In 1977, Queen told us that we are the champions and David Bowie that we could be heroes. In 2013, Kanye West told us I am God while Ariana Grande's 2018 recording record-breaking Thank You Next was written as a love song to herself. So is that, is that an example of that kind of a, at the individual level that, mind, that shift in a mindset? Yes, I mean, what is fascinating with pop song lyrics is that if you look from the 1980s onwards, you do, um, and there have been researchers who've kind of really studied pop song lyrics, and what they found was that collectivist words like we, us, and our have been steadily supplanted over the years with words like I, me, and myself. So our language has even become more individualistic over time. Um, showing where our priorities um, as a society have shifted with, I argue, you know, a very kind of negative effect. I'm sort of sticking to this question of the individual and, and I, mm. I can go away from it, but there's one more thing you wrote that I thought was interesting. It takes us back to the, the appeal of the populace or, or why they appeal. And uh, you were quoting somebody, the lonely mind sees snakes all the time. Um, what does that mean? And what does that, how does that translate into individuals being more aggressive, mm. for want of a better term, with one another? Mm. Well, it, aggressive, I mean, is, is, is the right term. There was research that I write about in my book done with mice. And the researchers um, put a left a mouse isolated in a cage and then they introduced into the cage a new mouse and what they discovered was the longer the mouse was isolated the more violently and aggressively it lashed out to the new mouse when it was introduced in and so you know we know that on average and of course this isn't everyone who is lonely so we're talking on average here but we know that on average people who are lonely 
are more likely to see outsiders as threatening, are more likely to see the world as a more hostile, threatening place. There was research done with um, siblings who lived in the same place, and the researchers found that the lonelier sibling was more likely to say that their neighborhood was threatening and hostile, even though they were living in the same neighborhood as, the, as their other sibling. So we know that there is that tendency. And coming back to right-wing populism, of course, that was something else that the right-wing populists have done you know, so effectively. They've played to that latent um, fear out there. And of course, the concern is right now that you know, what are months of enforced isolation going to do um, to people? Um, is this period going to ultimately bring us closer together because we've been um, helping each other out at neighborhood levels and at community levels in many places? And um, I don't know how it is uh, where you are, Steve, but I know in my neighborhood in London, you know, people have really risen to the challenge around and you know, helping other people out and delivering meals to elderly people who are on their own. And there has been this grassroots um, upsurge of community action and spirit. But at the same time, we also are seeing um, increased hate speech on social media, increased um, kind of, yeah, um, anti-other uh, sentiment. Um, so, you know, speaking perhaps to that downside of this protracted period of isolation, which is that people become more um, hostile towards those around them. So what do you think? How, how would you assess what might feel uh, will evolve if and when we are no longer uh, in enforced isolation? Well, Know what there you another, hope and what you think. So there's yeah. two different things. Well, I think it. I think there are there are like four kind of important contradictory trends that are coexisting right now. So one is this upsurge of community spirit and kind of recognition of the importance of our local neighborhoods, and I'm seeing this across the globe. So you know we are seeing kind of evidence of people coming together and helping each other. And in my book, I write about, you know, beautiful stories of, you know, there was one in, that I write about in the book of a man who went all around the city looking for glass um, bottles of milk so that a blind man um, could have them during the lockdown in the UK so that he could put the milk um, in his refrigerator and know that it was milk rather than other liquids, just because it was a glass bottle. And so people, you know, really going beyond the call of duty for sure. And, <clears throat> and you probably saw those beautiful um, images of um, in Italy, people on balconies during lockdown singing um, to their neighbors, very heart, heart moving. And yet, in the UK, we're now in lockdown three, where we're in very restricted lockdown again. And Italy, um, I was looking at some um, reports from Italy, and there is a bit of a fatigue with um, helping your neighbours in some places setting in already now. So you have that kind of initial bonding spirit, and then you have just the worn downness where you haven't had that face-to-face -face interaction um, where people are perhaps hunkering down and withdrawing. So you have those forces. And the two other really important contradictory forces are to acknowledge are you know, what we've seen is a massive acceleration over the past year of what I call contactless existence. So even before the pandemic, of course, people were, you know, shopping online and um ordering food on DoorDash. And you know, some people were even already doing their kind of yoga classes with Adrienne. But what we've seen is a massive um, acceleration of this contactless existence because we haven't had much choice. You know, um, E-commerce, um, doing your sports online, ordering in. And um, 
that comes, I argue, with a huge, with huge societal ramifications where we are, um, the danger is if that persists post-pandemic, that we trade off convenience for community. And not only that, that we, in so doing, lose, stop practicing um, some of the skills that are so fundamental to inclusive democracy, because even when we're in a grocery store wheeling our trolley around, you know, and having to think about somebody coming by and pass them by and navigating them and nodding at them, even when we're in a yoga studio thinking about where to put our mat and not downward dog right in front of somebody else, um, you know, those are things that are actually skills that are really important to practice because they are skills that, you know, of being considerate to others and thinking about others' needs and thinking about others' space. And, you know, as we move to an increasingly, if we move to an increasingly contactless world, um, the danger is we won't be practicing those skills. And yet at the same time as we're moving increasingly contactless, I'm also seeing an increased desire for connection. And um, right now that's severely circumscribed in most places by what we are or not allowed to do. Um, and we're seeing, but we are seeing a rise in people congregating online. So there was even, there were 12 and a half million people attended rapper Travis Scott's gig on Fortnite in April, for example. Um, so in, in within a game um, within Fortnite, but I think evidence of people wanting to come together in whatever way they can. And of course, we've already seen in Australia and New Zealand where um, things have opened up, people already, you know, in thousands at music festivals, um, in nightclubs, et cetera. In Taiwan, um, in the fall already, you had 5,000 people attending Phantom of the Opera. Um, performances in the theatre a night. So we have got this move to contactless and the convenience that it offers. But at the same time, we have this real, I think, increased, if anything, craving for physical in-person interactions. So we have these different things going on at once. You know, obviously, my hope is that we come together. My hope is that we use this moment um, as an opportunity to build back better, to reset, to reconnect capitalism with care and compassion, to, um, to use this moment in history in the same way that President Roosevelt came out of the Great Depression with the New Deal and policies that gave workers more rights and instituted public art programs across the nation in the same way that in the United Kingdom after World War II, we um, created the national health system, um, providing free healthcare to every single citizen. You know, out of these moments, we can have um, incredible um, coming together, um, societal um, unity, coming as a result of it, provided that that's where the leadership takes us, provided that that's where resources are put, um, provided that this is prioritized, because there's also a whole infrastructure of community that needs to be funded. Public parks, public libraries, youth clubs, daycare centers, elderly daycare centers. In the United States, federal funding for public libraries has fallen by 40% since 2008, since the financial crisis. We need to have physical spaces where people can be together, if people can come together. So, you know, my hope is that this is a moment that COVID, that our shared experience of collective isolation, um, that our realization of how fractured our lives our societies have become in recent years you know together will help catalyze a new a new era a new epoch my fear is that um that instead people will lash out at each other even more we instead of i it all it will a lot of it will depend on individuals but the leadership of communities as in communities as well let me read. I mean, you described something. I mean, here we are, right? We are both a community uh, with people engaged in this conversation, but unlike 
typical town hall meetings. We're all in our screens in our rooms rather than, rather than in a big group together. Um, let me read a couple of, of emails, some questions from folks. And if folks, if you have questions, we wanna hear from you. This is a conversation, right? Cause we are community. Um, so Arlene writes, I believe some loneliness is also that people are unable to be by themselves. They do not know how to be their own best company, to be excited, vital, connective. There's alone and lonely, right? Two different things. Yes, Arlene, you raise um, a really important distinction because, um, and I call that being alone, you know, that's, that's a choice of choosing to have time alone. And I'm somebody who loves having time alone, for sure. Um, time to read a book, time to meditate, time to just be. Um, that's different to when I use the term loneliness because loneliness is about a lack of choice. It's about a lack of agency. It's not about choosing to be on your own. It's about craving um, connection, intimacy being seen, being visible, and not having any of those things. Here's, um, well, let me just ask you something, because do you think, so I was mentioning to you that I did an interview with uh, this other uh, town hall guest uh, on the front lines of peace about how do you, how do you build peace in war-torn areas? And she comes down to the question of even communities in America. And really her argument is, People need to learn to listen. They need to sit across from one another and listen. Mm -hmm. And of course, in this post uh, pre, pre I don't even, I, you know, post Trump era, they, there is this idea that, well, if we could just sit down and talk to one another at the community level, we can talk about the things that we do care about, gardening, hunting, uh, mm -hmm. our trucks, <laughs> that our political divides would be um, eased a bit. We would see each other as individuals and not as emblems. Do you believe that? So I look at this um, a lot in my book and I, I, and I do believe that people, different types of people coming together, even for relatively short periods, can have a huge impact. And I say this based on um, experiments that have taken place across the world. In Germany, for example, there was an initiative where um, journalists were so concerned about how fractured the discourse was in Germany that they initiated a scheme which they called a kind of political Tinder where they matched up people with radically opposing political views. Um, thousands of people took part across Germany and all they had to agree to do was to meet up for two hours with their counterpart in a public place. And across Germany, people met up in beer gardens, in um, bars, in parks, in cafes. Uh, so, you know, somebody who was really anti-immigration met up with somebody who was really pro-immigration, somebody who was, um, you know, believed that women should just stay at home, um, met up with kind of staunch feminists. And what was fascinating was that even a two hour encounter had a very marked difference on how people felt about the other. They considered the other to be... Um, somebody much more like them, somebody that they were much more willing to introduce into their, have as part of their social uh, social uh, sphere. And also more interestingly said that they, um, after they did this experiment, were more likely to say that they trusted other Germans in general more hmm. as a result of doing it. And it was often things, it was often, you know, they saw each other as more human as a result, they saw the things that they had in common. So that was just speaking to each other. I think when you go even further and you do things with people different to you, um, that's when we see even more, um, even greater impact. I know in the, in the US, you you feel right now, rightly so, that you know you are a very fractured society politically, and of course you are. But it's important to remember that. Um, you know, the US isn't the only country in this situation. And, um, you know, and, and we have countries across the world who've been in even worse situations. Um, another example I look at in my book is from Rwanda, which of course is a country, you know, which was riven, um, you know, where terrible genocides with people literally from different factions killing each other. And that part of their process of reconciliation 
has been because of a scheme whereby one day a month, it's called Umuganda, one day a month, um, people of all different types have to actually do community service together. Um, so whether it's building stuff or cleaning litter, or but they have to do once a month, it's absolutely mandatory. People have to come together and do things together. Um, yeah, doing things together is, is an important way for people to be able to come together. And we can do this at a community level, we can do it um, at a voluntary level, but I think there is also a role for local government and um, for the state to play in engineering these um, interactions as well, so that what, it's not just people who want to do it doing it. What was Emmanuel Macron's uh, proposal? So he had, he actually ran a pilot. This is the um, French leader. He ran a pilot scheme for 16 and 17 year olds where they did mandatory um, community service together, where they lived together, um, a group of teenagers for a few months, had to live together and do community service together, voluntary work, um, civic service. Uh, people from different socioeconomic groups, different ethnic backgrounds, again, as a way to create bonds between people who are not ostensibly like you. And the, are there things schools could do? We could, you know, I can imagine high schools, you know, doing drama with schools, which are of very different makeups to their own of sports. You know, there are definite ways that we could engineer um, such schemes. Has there been any... Uh, evidence? Has there been any evidence, a study of uh, Macron's idea? Uh, and is it ongoing or was it a, just a pilot? So it piloted just before the coronavirus yeah. um, outbreak. So, um, but, but, but with the, with the, with the aim of, of this then being um, in place. So, um, so what about the uh, Theresa May and establishing a, a minister of loneliness? Anything that has come out of that? That can be talked about. So we we now have in the United Kingdom a Minister of Loneliness. That's a government minister actually charged with um, addressing loneliness. It's actually not something I would recommend um, other countries follow. Partly because you know it's a junior ministry. The budget um, that she uh, that our minister, who's a very nice woman, who I think is you know well-meaning, but you know she hasn't got much money to play with but also because the ministry and our government isn't recognizing that loneliness really has structural drivers, um, that loneliness is partly a result of the kinds of cities we've built, of the way we treat each other, of the kind of capitalism that's governing us, of the fact that we under-regulate our social media companies, of all of these factors. And so um, whilst our government is supporting important um, initiatives that uh, seek to address loneliness in communities. So, you know, whether it's um, gyms where um, teenage girls can kind of learn to box or um, sheds where men can go and do um, woodworking together and chat. Um, and these are all useful and important initiatives. Um, I'm concerned that it's not delivering the joined up um, and structural um, change that actually is needed if we are to make real impacts on how um, lonely society is. So that's why I think loneliness needs to be uh, thought about much more systemically within government. Let me read Lance's uh, question and then I, I want you to then come back to the question of the economics of it, like how workplaces could Mm -hmm. uh, arrange themselves differently. But but this goes back to something you had talked about earlier. Lance writes, could it be that social media fails us because we aren't using it to communicate to each other as much as we use it to broadcast to one and all? Yes. Um, but it incentivizes that behavior in us. It incentivizes a performative um behavior and it also incentivizes actually anger and hate speech posts that um they include words like hate in them and angry words are retweet retweeted on average 30 percent more 
and then um, posts that don't. So the whole kind of the algorithms, the way that these um, platforms are designed, they're designed to encourage us to present inauthentic selves, which will get more likes and more retweets, and also to present angrier, um, more polarized views and opinions. Um, so yes, you know, we can, and definitely, you know, when you are using your own social media, you know, do try and um, be nicer on it. Um, do try and um, use the media as, as best you can. But, but I think we, sh we also need to recognize that the platforms themselves need to change if they are to be, um, to, to meet their promise, um, their espouse promise of connecting us in a healthy way. Well, let's, 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 let's end with this question of the economy and all this, because basically you write that we need to see a transition, individuals need to a transition from seeing ourselves as consumers to citizens. So mm -hmm. let's look at that consumer part of it. We've talked about the citizen part of it a lot, but what, what can individuals do or really what can capitalism do? Let, let's start there. Capitalism do to, to bring people together. What are some steps and what are some policies? So, um, you know, at a kind of, you know, thinking at a very micro level, you know, there's employers, what can employers do? Um, we know that the workplace, even before the pandemic, was incredibly lonely for many people. 40% of office workers in the United States said that they were lonely at work, lonely at the office. So, you know, employers can recognize that they have a role to play in bringing people together post pandemic. And I don't believe that this is the new normal, a world of remote work. Um, you know, I don't think that that is where we should aim to be heading. Um, and, and so thinking about how to redesign the office so that people actually can feel more connected is really important moving forward. And there's a very simple thing that works incredibly well, which is encouraging employees to eat together. Um, research that was done in Chicago with firefighters found that companies of firefighters who ate together were not only happier and felt more bonded, but they performed twice as well as companies that didn't. So we know that there's a business, a significant economic cost to businesses of lonely employees because they're less motivated, less productive, less efficient, but also that there are fixes um, which can deliver, like getting people to eat together or take breaks together, another thing, um, which delivers both happiness and more productivity, so a win-win. Um, at a bigger level, um, you know, I th there is an agenda needed to reconnect capitalism with care and compassion. It's partly about valuing care more. I mean, in recent years, as qualities like hyper-competitiveness have been valorized, qualities like care for others and compassion you know, have been completely undervalued by the market. And we've seen you know, teachers, for example, you know, very underpaid, um, you know, reliant on market forces to determine that. And, um, and, and that needs to change. You know, we need to value care and those who care for us much more. Um, and at an individual level, of course, there's so much that we can do. Um, we can try and put our own phones down more. I know it's hard because we are addicted to them, but try and be more present with those around us, especially when there are people physically in a room in front of us. We can seek to nurture and support our local communities more. You know, incredibly important right now when our local stores and cafes and restaurants are really struggling, having to deal with the triple whammy of the economic downturn, the coronavirus and the move to contactless existence. So we can actively seek to nurture these because they are the anchors of our community. They, these stores, these shops, these cafes help us feel connected to each other. And of course, we can also think and should be thinking right now, is there anyone in our own network who might be feeling lonely? And if there is, actively reach out to them send them a text. If we can meet up for them with them in a socially distanced way, meet up with them, make a phone call. Because just showing someone that we're thinking of them, 
that they're visible to us, that we care, can make a huge difference to how someone feels. I was also struck by a couple of policy ideas you've mentioned. Um, because of the increasing autom automation, people are losing their jobs. How are they going to integrate into life? You, you have talked about, Bill Gates uh, has talked about a robot tax mm -hmm. and using that money, which sounds amazing. And also the empty store tax, which would be a way to encourage landlords not to allow storefronts to remain empty while big box stores draw off all their clientele. I, I, I mean, are these kinds of real practical economic um, approaches, have they been tested anywhere? Would they... Do, they, do we know they might work? Yes, my book is full of ideas of what we can do to come together again. And the ideas are not pie in the sky, kind of utopian ideals which have come out of nowhere. No, I'm, I'm citing things that have worked in practice across the world, um, including in the United States. For example, there's an initiative that I talk about in the United States um, that Mayor Rahm Emanuel did when he was mayor of Chicago, where he um, built new social housing um, buildings with branches of the Chicago Public Library on the ground floor. You know, I love that initiative. You know, that's a way of kind of building social housing, but ensuring that there are, you know, hubs, real community hubs kind of built into them, but also community hubs which have value to those in the neighborhood who might otherwise have wanted to keep their distance from people in these buildings. Um, in Belgium, there's an empty shop tax that you mentioned, which was implemented. I don't know if you have had this same problem in Seattle, but it's something we've definitely had in London, where um, you know we're seeing increasing numbers of shops left empty because um, the land, the rents are going up, um, and the landlords want to put the rents up, and, be, and the tenants can't afford them, and so and the landlords would rather keep them empty, waiting for the tenant who can pay the higher rent is that something oh yeah yeah oh yeah we have that yeah and then and so, on, on top of that we have these mandated public um uh, uh, ground floors that are mandated to be shops but their the economics doesn't quite work out for the landlord so the landlord just leaves those empty as well rather no, than then, forcing so them to put somebody in there so there needs, you know, we need these spaces to be habited um, by businesses, by co-working spaces, by community spaces. And so in um, Belgium, for example, the, um, what they've done is they've imposed, they impose a tax on shops that are left empty after a period um, which rises month by month so that landlords are disincentivized from keeping a shop empty. I mean, that's just one thing that can be done um, in the United Kingdom now. And, you know, maybe it's the same where you are now. You know, there's also kind of whole rethink of um, taxes that local taxes that stores need to pay at the moment during the pandemic. But we need to rethink that moving forward. I, I think there should even be a new tax status of pro-community businesses, businesses that are demonstrably pro-community should pay lower taxes. I mean, even something like your local bookstore, I mean, that plays a huge role in our communities, in anchoring and nurturing our communities. Stores like that, cafes that, that actively are inclusive and help people to come together, they should be deemed pro-community and have a different tax status. So there's so, so much that can be done if the will is there. I was, do you think your um, economist colleagues would like a, a, a tax that encouraged people to either, you know, have coffee clatches in their cafes as opposed to not? I mean, would they find that too much uh, social engineering? Would they chafe at that? Well, um, it depends which economists you're oh, seeing. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, my, my camp... You know, my camp, um, you know, I'm sure would support this, this. I'm sure would support this. Um, but we are a broad spectrum of ideas within the heading of economists, for sure. Where do labor unions? I'll, this will be my last question for you, unless folks have some more questions for you through email, which I'd love to get a few more in. Where do labor unions fit into this 
whole question of of loneliness and community because they could be both exclusive and inclusive of course historically so one of the reasons i think one of another reason that we haven't touched upon yet on why we are lonelier now than in the past is because we do less together with people in general we um are less likely to eat together with other people we're less likely to go to parent teacher associations we're less likely to go to church and we're less likely to be members of trade unions and i think trade unions historically have played a really important role actually in um bringing people together and giving um, of course, people a um, collective voice. And it's, I've been really struck in kind of recent months that the, um, albeit still from a small level, but the kind of increased desire for unionization amongst white collar workers at companies like Alphabet, um, Google, where, you know, even at these places recognizing actually, it is, you know, unions can give us a voice, um, a collective voice that can be empowering. Um, but unions also historically, you know, providing um, a sense of brotherhood and community to many that is lost. So I, I think trade unions have an important role to play um, moving forward. Um, and and they, have a, they have to get better at rethinking their role in a new world of work, a world of gig economy workers, um, a world um, you know, that is very different to the kind of industrialized world in which they first really began. And as you touch on, uh, we're seeing some changes there, like for example, the ruling about uh, uh, Uber. Uh, Uber workers, right? And whether they're treated as employees or not. Yeah, that's, that's a very seminal, um, that's very seminal, this kind of change on, you know, are they are they gig economy workers or are they actually um, are they actually employees? And um, you know, it's you know, I write about it in the book. The right. uh, the um, the fact that so many of these platform businesses, you know, are not upholding um, the rights of their workers because they're. Um, pretending that these that their employees are not actually employees and therefore you know creating a class of worker who feels understandably very alienated and isolated as a result well i'll end with this you touched on this but uh, the, but these came in and, and they go back to the point you just made do you think that the downsizing of social clubs such as the elks dinner clubs etc has increased loneliness and had an effect on our loss of bonding within society. You, 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 meant, you answered that. And then if we become a more remote and robotic society, should we then balance things out by creating more social oriented clubs that are distinctly separated from work life? What do you think? Well, I think anything we can do moving forward to preserve, encourage, support in person, face-to-face -face interactions will be worth doing, especially though, and importantly, if they are inclusive. Um, you know, the, the last thing we want is for community to be something that only the rich can afford. Right. All right, Narina Hertz, thank you very much. The Lonely Century, that's a dense book. There's a lot to think about there. It's really great. I appreciate you talking about it. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Seattle Town Hall, for having me on. Yeah, and on, on behalf of Town Hall, I want to thank you both so much for presenting with us today. Marina, thank you so much for your work. This is so fascinating. And uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking every, every day I get a little bit closer to deleting my Facebook. So I appreciate the encouragement. <laughs> um, I want to thank our audience for watching as well. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of The Lonely Century, uh, you can use the link in the chat below to uh, purchase through Elliott Bay, one of our great local uh, community building institutions. Um, so give them some support so they can make it through this uh, these difficult time. Um, I hope that you both uh, stay safe and um, hopefully next time uh, we have you, we can we can be in person. Um, uh, have a great have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.